And I'd like to welcome Dr. Carl Rossi. He's the medical director for California Protons. Welcome back, sir. Always a pleasure yeah, to have well, you and you folks up from for having San me. Diego. Yeah. And uh, today, the, the subject that we're going to talk about um, is the history of proton okay. therapy because, uh, you know, it, it is very cutting edge technology, but yet it goes back a long quite a ways. way. Yeah, long at way. least uh, where, um, you know, back where it really kind of started in its right. infancy, it's, it's, yeah. it wasn't just a few years ago. No, it's I mean, a long it's time actually ago. this. You know, this is based on a discovery that was made in 1903, so over a century ago. And in the essence, oh, I didn't know it went back oh, that yeah, far. That, well, wow. that's when this was when, when, when it was first <laughs> discovered. Wow. You know, the, the essence of proton treatment is that we're using a Jeez. beam of radiation that stops. Yeah. And it stops because of the physical properties of protons. That was discovered mm -hmm. in 1903 by a gentleman named William Bragg. He was a PhD, a physicist who eventually won the Nobel Prize uh, for some other work he did. But he found out that if you shot protons into things, they would go to a certain distance and they would stop and not go beyond that point. So if you're going to radiate a tumor, you could bring in a dose, hit it, and not treat the stuff past it. Well, again, that's 1903. That's amazing. 1946 rolls around, so now we're just at the end of World War II. Mm -hmm. And there's another PhD physicist named Robert Wilson who writes a paper. He says, this property of protons that they actually will stop is as very handy. It may have some very interesting implications in medicine, provided that we have the ability to localize what we want to hit. Mm -hmm. So again, we're talking about the year after World War II ended. We didn't have CAT scans, yeah. didn't have any of that stuff. But the idea was put out there in the medical literature. Then you fast forward to the mid-1950s, and people first start trying it. And, yeah. and they were doing this with machines that were never designed to treat people. They did this at the Harvard Cyclotron Lab in Los Alamos. And you know, we look at it today, and it looks literally like Frankenstein's lab, mm -hmm. but that's the best they could do at the time. Right. And they show that it was safe and effective. Between the late 1950s and 1990, there were literally several thousand patients treated around the world that way. Not very many at a time, because the machines were never designed for that, but enough to show it was safe, it was effective, it had reduced toxicities, and what changed the whole uh, ability for, pa for a large number of patients to get it is that in 1990 was when you had the, the first medical proton center opened up, uh, which there are now 30 in the United States and about another 50, 60 around the world. And by medical center, I mean, this is a place that was designed to do proton treatment with medicine as its primary mission. Mm -hmm. So instead of being able to treat one to two people a day and treat very specific things like certain eye tumors and brain tumors, you can treat 100 patients a day, yeah. and you can treat head to toe if you need to, brain, breast, lung, you know, prostate, all the things that you would normally treat in a cancer center. Uh, you know, going, going back years and years ago, when they found this out with the protons, is it depending on the type of, the strength of protons? Yeah. I mean, because obviously what you folks do, you, uh, when you treat someone, it's gonna be different for everyone. We Absolutely. want it to stop at this point, but the other patient, we want it to go a little That's bit right. further. So, First of all, you know, tumors are not conveniently this big. They right. come in all different shapes and yeah. sizes. And what we're able to do by imaging the patients and making, in effect, a three-dimensional model of what we want to mm -hmm. hit, you can design a plan so that you manipulate this stream of protons so that the protons will stop within that volume. Okay. And effectively, you just fill that volume up. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like playing, what was that game years ago, Tetris? When you yeah, pretty much. Or, or another way of looking at it, <laughs> if you've ever seen the way a 3D printer works, yeah. you, know, you build a solid object by putting in layers right. of dose. This is a yeah. 3D printer with radiation. Wow, fascinating. Now, uh, not everybody, and I, I think mm -hmm. you told me this mm -hmm. before, this is not uh, maybe appropriate for everyone, am I right? It depends no. on the type of cancer or how it's spread, and, am I correct? Th that's, that's correct. So yeah. radiation therapy in general, whether it's protons or the more traditional x-ray treatment, we tend to use that primarily on things that are localized Okay. because it's a great treatment for that. Yeah. So this isn't for, say, a primary treatment for, say, a leukemic patient where mm. the disease is head yeah. to toe. But there are an awful lot of things that are localized. And again, right. you just you go from the top of the head to the bottom, and you can you can consider all these different sites of disease that can be benefited by protons. And the biggest uh, reward, so to speak, in this is that you're yeah. treating just the area. Correct. Yeah, the primary yeah. benefit of this is not that we do a better job at curing the patient, 
we do a better job of not harming the patient. Yeah. The, this, we, we've known for a long time that radiation's a toxin, mm -hmm. right? And that there's no benefit to treating healthy tissue. Yeah. There's one safe dose of radiation we're absolutely, that people all agree on, and that's zero. Yeah. So if you can, for example, treat a breast cancer patient and not treat her heart, because you stop the beam before it ever gets to the heart, mm -hmm. then her risk of radiation-induced heart disease is zero. Yeah. So if, if someone comes in, um, or a patient goes mm -hmm. to their, you know, their primary care and then a mm -hmm. specialist, how do they come about using you folks? Meaning, uh, yeah. you know, because not everyone, there, there are great centers out there Correct. that treat cancer and all that. Not everyone uses this. And one, I'm wondering why. Is it because maybe the costs or the machinery or people aren't aware of it? It's, pro it's like most things that you'd expect, it's a combination of all those factors. Okay. First of all, in terms of the, the cost and payment for treatment, you know, the FDA has recognized proton therapy as an acceptable form of radiotherapy mm -hmm. for, gosh, over three decades. And then, for example, Medicare has reimbursed for proton treatment, covered it since 1991. Okay. So for many patients, you know, the insurance barrier is there, for many it is not. Okay. But how do our patients hear about it? Um, they sometimes hear about it from their physician. Mm -hmm. It's sad to say that a lot of physicians are either not aware of it or they, they think, oh, it can only be used on esoterica. Uh, I, was, I was told just last week by a physician that, I, well, I can't, you can't use protons to do a certain treatment. I'm like, well, we've been doing that for, for 20 years. You just didn't yeah. know it. But an awful lot of patients, and this is, you know, I think is great, they do their own research. Mm -hmm. you know, they get on the internet, they start reading, they realize that there are potentially alternatives that are equally effective but less harmful. And you know, if they're fortunate enough to live within a relatively close distance of a center and or have the means to get there, they come see us directly. They don't need to be referred. Many okay. of them are, many of them are not. They, make their, they refer themselves. Okay, so that's even if uh, someone has an, an HMO plan uh, or Medicare HMO or uh, a Medicare Advantage, I should sure. say, can they refer themselves? Absolutely. They can, okay. Yeah, they, they okay. generally can. What may happen if they're with an HMO is the HMO may decline to cover the cost of the consultation. And the HMO may say, no, we're not going to cover the cost of therapy because we can give you something which is equally curative, mm -hmm. which, again, it may be true from the standpoint of disease control, but it may not be true from the standpoint of harm. So we do a lot of, uh, you know, we, uh, appeals for a patients being denied. We do a lot of comparative planning mm -hmm. where we'll show and ensure, look, here's a proton plan. Here's an x-ray plan. Look at the difference in dose to the heart and the lung mm -hmm. and such. Right. And we do a lot of, you know, a lot of fighting sometimes to get patients treated. That's true in medicine in general, well, unfortunately. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Now, you guys are located down in San Diego. Correct. And I think you're right outside of the city, just yeah, a bit? Yeah, we're, we're, the facility is located in Mira Mesa, but okay. right on the north side of, of uh, Marine Corps Air Station, Miramar. All right. Uh, let me see, the plane's, plane's going over. That's right. right. I right. hear them all the time. <laughs> yes, see the, see the top guns out there. Yep. And uh, do you have centers elsewhere or just down well, there for now? Or do you work with other centers? You mentioned there's like several yeah, places throughout yeah, the country. Yeah, there, there there, as of this week, there are 30 operating proton centers in the United States. In mm -hmm. fact, number 30, which is Emory University in Atlanta, treated their first patient on Tuesday. But of those 30, uh, there are only four in the Western United States. So, the, the, you know, there's Scripps, I'm sorry, the former Scripps. Yeah, California right, Protons, you guys work, yeah. Loma Linda, which was the first one built and is now 30 years old. Mm -hmm. There's a Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale, Arizona, and University of Washington. So the geographic distribution wow. is large. Now we have, amongst all the proton centers, we have clinical trials that we do. There's a, a clinical okay. trial group called, uh, PT, one's called a Prague and some other ones and we coordinate care amongst patients all the time. We also do a lot of work with, uh, we, we get a lot of referrals from various institutions where they may have a challenging case they send us. Like we treated patients from Cedar sinai and we treat patients from UCLA, and I think we're you know, our, our strongest clinical partner and certainly a very um, a champion of proton therapy is the University of California, San Diego. Okay. Yeah, they are, they are our clinical partner now. Um, they have several of their physicians which are working at the proton center, either full-time or part-time. Mm -hmm and they treat a number of their patients there. So we do a lot of coordinating, whether it's with other proton centers or probably more commonly with other um, academic and large private centers that say, look, we've got a particular case. We think this could benefit. Can we get that patient to you? In which we say, yes, you can. And in fact, we try to get them involved beyond that. You want to bring your, one, one of your docs down to look at how we do this. You want us to show us to, to be able to electronically help us with the planning. Try to make them feel that they have um, you know, an interest and in, they can actually learn something in the process. Yeah, very good.
Thank you very much. Thank you. It's always good to see you. Oh, yeah, thank you. I appreciate yeah, the opportunity. You got good folks that come up uh, from uh, your uh, center down in San Diego. Appreciate the drive up. And if you like more information, it's very easy. Just uh, search CaliforniaProtons.com, and there you go. All right, we'll be right back. Yeah, thank Doctor, you. Doctor, thank you. Sure.